Thanks, worship team, for leading us so well. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> I have one of them right here. We actually thought, yeah, thought if he could like do his own bramcha with the jokes, but next time. <laughs> so if you've been around with us a bit in the summer, uh, you'll, you'll notice that we're doing this set in August where we uh, hear our, each other's stories. I think something, a feature of the church all through time is people sit around and say, what has Jesus done in your life? Did you, did you meet him this week or how did he change you? So as we sit around, you know, I sort of want to imagine that we're sitting around in a big circle and equally this could be you sitting here. Uh, and so as we ask and answer these questions, uh, I want you to be attending to hear like, what would the Lord be asking you? How, what would you share if you had the chance? So that's kind of the tone of what we're doing here today. So we really want to, as we, the theme uh, we've called it for this series is Rekindling First Love. And uh, I sort of extended that, Rekindling First Love in the Wilderness. Because I think when we live in this world, it's like a wilderness. So this is maybe this morning kind of like a field guide, some tips along the way. So wherever you're at on your journey this morning, really uh, want you to feel like you're hearing the Lord and hearing your own story echo here. So, Paul. Good morning. Good morning. Don't hold the bottom. Is that okay? No, that's good. Okay, that's thank good. you. So uh, why don't you start us off, and for people don't, who don't know you, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Paul, and I'm a sinner saved by grace. Amen. You can clap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, let me see more about me. Uh, I'm married to Andrea, who's here, and I have two kids, Josh, who's 15, almost 16, on his way to camp today, and my daughter, Hannah, who is 12. Uh, for a job, I uh, co-own and operate a landscape maintenance company in the, uh, in the city here, and uh, a few people sitting here have worked with me, for me, against me, but... Uh, <laughs> Not looking at you, Trevor. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, uh, it's been a blessing. It's provided for the family, and uh, it keeps me in shape <laughs> most of the time. Yeah, yeah, nice. Um, I guess I'll fill out a few details, too. We'll be going yeah. back and forth. So in my own case, too, I, I came down to Vancouver in 2011, moved here from Alberta with my wife, Clienza. We've got four kids, Kiara, Jelena, Callan, and Treya. So this has been our church for about 11 years, and um, oh, three years ago I started working here as a youth and young adults pastor, so that's how I get here, and um, yeah. Paul, my next question for you. Yeah. Can you tell us about your early years, your growing up, to what extent maybe Christian faith was part of your upbringing? Yeah. Uh, so... Uh, I grew up in the town of Hope. This has nothing to do with my Christian upbringing, but uh, it's a small town, and uh, my family was very involved with the church, so um, all my immediate family, uh, my extended family, uh, most of my friends were all part of the church, so um, I understood the truth of who Jesus was from a very, very early age, and um, uh, really church life and sort of life of faith was kind of everything to me. It was, it was all I knew, and um, uh, it was a blessing, and uh, uh, where am I going now? Yeah, so I... I uh, I learned a lot during those early years. Uh, I accepted Christ when I, th I think I was about four or five uh, at uh, VBS. And, um, and uh, I, I knew what it meant to be saved throughout the rest of my life. Um, so uh, how about you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I was thinking that, I mean, in a way, our stories are very similar, and probably like a lot of you, uh, I could take a show of hands, who grew up in the church from a very early age? Many of you. Yeah, many of you. And so that is one of the blessings down through the thousands of years of the church, is we've, you know, like you and I, born into the church, so that's my story as well. 
my parents tell me that I first sort of accepted Christ watching a Billy Graham crusade on TV. And I, I, st I started running around the uh, coffee table. I was accepting Christ, apparently. So, <laughs> and, and yet, uh, through, through then the years to follow, I guess my story, like many of us, is one of this progressive knowledge and progressive transformation as what we taught from an early age starts to sort of land in our own heart in different ways. Yes. And... Uh, like last week, we heard a story of Ellen who didn't know there was even someone called Jesus until her 20s, and he sort of stepped in from outside. And, and yet, our, so that's, there's that story, and then there's our story of like, you grew up yes. knowing it, and yet Jesus is then knocking on the door to say, will you yeah. re really be my follower? Because it doesn't just depend on your parents and your grandparents. That's how about, right. how about yeah, so yeah, say more yeah. about that. Yeah, that's right. So I think as I grew up, uh, into my 20s and 30s, I started to realize that my experience as a Christian um, looked more like a resume than it did a testimony. Um, it, do you know what I mean when I say that? It was more sort of, um, I, I got to keep to my notes here. Um, I think I, I got to the point where I liked being a Christian more than I loved Christ. Uh, so the pattern of going to church and having church friends and um, you know, going to summer camp or being involved with music in church, it was all good and, and uh, I, I liked it. So for me, it made sense that you know, I'm a Christian, this is what I do, this is who I am. Um, but yeah, so I don't know that I necessarily loved Christ in that. And um, as I got older, my faith became more and more about Christian duty um, and being part of the Christian community, which is all good, but I didn't have a growing personal relationship with Jesus. Um, I maintained a good appearance to mask the reality that I had seen in my life and that I wasn't perfect, but um, yeah, th there became a sort of a, a, a little bit of a barrier there. And maybe I was almost hiding in the church from Jesus, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really appreciate that thought and something we talked about this week because it mirrors my experience of this, somehow this ability to sort of live a double life you know, you're in the church, you're growing up, and you know how to do the church stuff, but Jesus is knocking at the door saying, will you really be a believer? So I experienced that as well, sort of that being in many ways more attracted, especially in the later high school years by my friends and the, the culture and the parties they were going to, and yet able to go to church on Sunday and, and be, sort of play that game. So one of the thoughts we, we talked about is how do we, how does Jesus change our mindset from this duty-bound sort of we can perform it to a heart focused on Jesus? Because um, I think that's, that's what Jesus wants, a holistic faith that affects every area. It's what you do at school, what you do at work. It's not just something you do in a building like this. Um, and so that's what I wanted to talk about next as we were... I didn't experience that, but uh, I had a dream, and uh, I'll share that dream with you. It's one of the very few times when after you dream, you're usually like, oh, that was weird. But this time I sat down and I wrote it out. And uh, so I'm just gonna read, read you what I wrote. Um, so in my dream, I was walking in the forest and I became lost. And this, this does apply to my specific story. Remember, I grew up in Hope, it's basically all forest and mountains. And I knew my way around. So being lost there was almost an impossibility, really, for a kid like me that was just in the bush all the time. Um, so anyways, I was walking in the forest and I became lost in my dream. I cried for help and eventually I heard my salvation. It was a rescue helicopter. So I moved out of the trees enough uh, so that they could locate me, right? 
and uh, the helicopter hovered high overhead and lowered down, started to lower down a line to me. It was my lifeline. So grabbed it, wrapped it around my waist, and I knew that I was saved. I knew that I was going to be okay. And when I looked up as I was preparing to be lifted off the ground and into the air, uh, I noticed that it was Jesus that was captaining the helicopter. And uh, so then a strange mix of feelings kind of came over me. And um, like uh, Jesus himself was going to be pulling me up. And I was thrilled that he had saved me, that I'd been found as a lost person in the forest. But uh, was I ready for Jesus to bring me up? It was, it was kind of a weird feeling. Um, I thought so, but as I looked up at him, I was also nervous. So subconsciously, I started to back up again into the trees. And uh, I was still attached to the rope, but there was enough slack, and I just backed up into the trees. And um, soon I had wrapped myself three times around a huge Douglas fir tree. And uh, as the wind from the helicopter blew the branches back and forth, I would get glimpses of the crew and, uh, and Jesus up there in the helicopter. And uh, his crewmates were sort of waving their arms and shaking their heads. And, uh, and they were yelling something at Jesus. Um, but Jesus just kept looking right at me. Uh, he never once lost sight of me. And uh, that made me feel better. But I still stayed where I was. Uh, with the rope wrapped tightly around the tree and then tied to my waist. Um, what I didn't understand at the time was that the crewmates were telling Jesus that the winch couldn't handle the stress of pulling on that tree um, and everything else, and uh, that it was going to burn out. And uh, so they were advising Jesus to cut me loose. Leave me behind. Um, the rescue was futile. So his response to them was very clear. He said, no, I won't leave him. And a little while passed in this holding pattern. Uh, sorry, this is going on a little long, but... Uh, Keep going. This I'm is reading, what, reading what I said, what I saw. Um, uh, where was I when the, in this holding pattern? And then I heard some loud noises and I kind of felt a jerk on the rope. Um, and when I looked up, I could see that the winch had now completely failed. Um, but instead of it falling to the ground and me being just left there, uh, I realized that Jesus himself was holding the other end of the rope. Um, Uh, so I realized, you know, how my feet started to lift off the ground. Uh, I looked up and I'm kind of dangling there and Jesus, uh, looks down at me. Um, he says, it's okay, Paul, I've got you. And what the jerk was, was he actually had pulled the tree out and I was hanging there and the tree was sort of hanging beside me. Um, he said, it's okay, Paul, I've got you. Come up to me now. Let go of the tree. I've got you. And after he spoke, I finally relaxed and said, yes, Lord, I, I want to come. And so as soon as I uttered those words, the tree just sort of fell away. And um, I started to go up closer to Jesus, keeping my eyes on him gradually getting closer and closer and closer. That's the end of my dream. That's awesome. Um, That's cool. Yeah. Part action movie, 
part spiritual transformation. <laughs> yeah. um, can I just share a little bit about that still? I want to give you a chance to interject. No, but, please go. Um, so the dream paralleled the reality of what was actually going on in my life. And um, it, Jesus saved me when I was lost. Yes, I was saved. I knew I was saved from the age of four or five. Uh, but even though I was saved, there was more for me. I was lost in the idea that I had to perform a duty to him to maintain my salvation. And um, so in the dream, I, I describe how I, when he lowered the rope, I backed away from him. Um, and that was me hiding in the church, like I said before. I was, I was reluctant to give myself completely, to be brought up closer to him. I just wanted to kind of be in the holding pattern. Um, but, but he wanted to give me the fullness of himself. Not just, hey, Paul, you're saved from hell. Have a good day. It, he wanted to give me more of himself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he wants the same for all of us. Yeah. Right? I'm, I'm thankful he's persistent in his love and his pursuit. Yeah. So, yeah. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm going to add to that and then go jump back in. Because um, when I heard you tell that story, I don't know, maybe, I won't take a show of hands, but maybe Jesus has met you in a mysterious way. Maybe it was a dream or a nudge or just that you can't quite describe how he met you. And you made a, con in that dream, you made a conscious decision. And that was real. Uh, so equally, when I was younger, I, I had a, a dream, and uh, without going into the same detail, the presence of the Lord was there. It's like I was in a waiting room, and this figure entered, and, and I wasn't prepping to have this dream. It just was happening, and I knew it was Jesus. And we all had the, it was like immigration. We all had these papers, and he was sort of, you know, gently but powerfully moving to each person, and suddenly he was there. And I couldn't even look him in the face because I, I knew that, the papers represented my life. I knew I was living a double life. And he gently but firmly took them. And his only, I still remember it, the only words to me was, you need to get your papers in order. <laughs> and I woke up in a sweat, looking around like, so it was a combination of feeling called, caught and called out, but drawn to love. It's like, I want more for you, and you know it's not right. I know it's not right. So I woke up d different, but not different. The, this, this, the interchange had really happened, but I had work to do. And so this is the second part of this sort of resume of transformation that you said. There's then actions that you took that I took that sort of cooperated with, with clearly what Jesus was doing. So you mentioned something about the Bible, being drawn to the Bible. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to give you a chance to chat about that. Uh, yeah. So I think as I realized um, I needed more of Jesus in my life, yeah. um, I was drawn insatiably to the Word of God at this point. Like I had come to the point of repentance, like get stuff right, like you were saying, no more double life. Um, but then the first thing that came on me was just, I like, if I don't open the Bible and start to read it right now, I don't know if I will survive. Like, it was a physical hunger that I was experiencing. Um, he had revealed to me how, <laughs> how malnourished my soul was. Um, and, you, you know, I was involved in Bible studies, and I sat in church every Sunday listening to sermons, so I was being fed but I wasn't allowing myself to be fed the way he, um, he wanted me to. He wanted me to engage on a deeper level. And it couldn't happen until repentance happened. Um, but yeah, so the Bible really came alive to me. As I read verses, they were jumping off the page. It was as if they had been written for me just before I sat down to read them. Um, and it, it started to blow me away. Um, yeah, and cool. so I noticed a change also in other parts of my life. Um, my relationships got deeper with people in the church. Like, I wasn't just like, hey, I'm Paul, how you doing? Okay, good, yep, see you, bye. Um, it was, 
can I tell you about what God's doing in my life? And what's he doing in your life? Like, where, you know, where is he leading you right now? Is it like, have you, have you read this stuff in the Bible already? Like, do you know this verse? Like, I've got to tell you this. Like, this is amazing. And uh, so I just found there was a complete shift from um, a duty into a, an excitement and a gratitude for his grace. Um, yeah. yeah. I love that. I was listening to something this week, and the speaker said, this God of the universe with all his power to call creation into being, so this all this raw power, the one thing he won't do is force us into relationship with him. He just won't. And so he will see us living how we want and continually giving us this invitation, but when we don't want it, he will reluctantly and sadly allow us our own to take our own way. And this speaker was saying, when the Bible calls about, talks about the wrath of God, that's the wrath of God. It's not him punishing. It's, it's him reluctantly releasing us to what we've chosen and the consequences that follow. But then always just like wanting to rescue because that's not where he wants to leave us. Yeah. Um, so Yeah, the relentless pursuit. Yeah. So whether you sit in the church every day or whether you're a person like Ellen who God intervened in a real mm -hmm. way, yeah. like one day out of the blue, God's pursuing you and I, yeah. and, um, and he is relentless. That yeah. pursuit is relentless. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. So as you sort of are drawn to the Bible and committed to sort of this daily Bible reading, one of, one of the action choices I made was, uh, so after that dream, after that sort of beginning of wanting to transform, there I was back on university campus, and it was clubs day, signing up, and I, I found myself at the ski club, which actually is the party club. So I was kind of signing up. Jesus was sort of like, you know, the flags were going off. Don't sign up. But I did. But then right beside, this other guy is shaking my hand. And I look, and it's this club called the Navigators, which turned out to be the Christian club. And I was like, in my heart, it was sort of, uh. Anyways, I signed up for that too. But guess who called me back? Chris from the Navigators. He called me back. Yeah, I don't know what the other guys did with my name, but he, Chris called me back, and so then I had a choice to make. So yeah, I said yes to an invitation to join a Christian community at that age. They were doing Bible study in the pub where I had been, but not for Bible study. So there I was studying Bible, also being captivated by Jesus jumping off the page in ways I clearly knew about as a kid, but it hadn't landed in my heart. And so... That, that was sort of an action I made, is saying, saying yes to that community and leaning in, and, and Jesus, I found him leaning right back to me. So as we, as we get on, uh, this question I want to ask next is, is there a verse or verses that uh, have been significant to you? Uh, yes. Um, there's, there's two. Is that okay? Uh, the first one comes with a little bit of a story, really short, and the second one I just have to explain as well, but... Um, so the first one uh, is from Deuteronomy. And uh, I had a mentor who challenged me. He said, Paul, uh, it's great that you're in the Word and you love it and that you're learning tons, but I want to challenge you to take time every morning to sit down and spend time in God's Word. And you will not be disappointed, he said. So I said, Okay, you know, I'm reading it a lot. Mornings, whatever, I like to just wake up and go to work, but I'll get up a little bit early and I'll, I'll give it a try. Uh, so the first day of my new endeavor, I looked and I saw the reference was, I just decided I'll do the verse of the day. And I looked and I saw the reference was Deuteronomy and I'm like, oh great. This is like Moses did something and God smoked somebody and it's going to be just one of these things that means nothing. And then I read the words and it was Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 7. It goes like this. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down, and when you get up. I said, okay, God, <laughs> I get it. You want me to do this, and it's important. Uh, so that, that's the first one. 
and the second one, which applies uh, directly to me, and maybe you guys can relate to this too if you've been involved in the church for a long time, is uh, Revelation 3.20. And I think this is one of the verses probably that was recited to me when I accepted Christ as a little kid at VBS all those years ago. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. And it wasn't until much, much later, this is the short explanation about this verse, it wasn't until much, much later that I realized that when Jesus said those words, he wasn't talking to people that were searching for him outside of the church. It comes in the context of speaking to the church of Laodicea. And he starts that passage um, by saying, you guys are lukewarm. You're neither hot nor cold. And if you don't pick a direction, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. So his words of, I'm knocking at the door, he's talking to Christians. He's talking to people that believe that have been saved. He's saying, I am knocking at the door. Will you let me in? And if you do, I'm going to come in. I'm going to sit with you, and we're going to share a meal. And we are going to become closer than you could have ever imagined. So those are my verses. That's awesome. Yeah. So have to let that sort of steep and sit with us. What I love that. And just Jesus does speak to our hearts. I, I really yeah. hope he's speaking to you now as you hear that call. Um, so I was thinking of a verse, and again, it was in the context of hearing something this week. I'd heard this before, but it just came back to me in a fresh way, so I'm going to read it and, and uh, offer it to you guys as the church. It's from Ezekiel chapter 36, uh, verse 23 to 28, and it says, God says this to his people Israel, I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. So they were living a double life. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord, when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. So there we are deep in the Old Testament talking about the Holy Spirit and this heart renewal and flash forward to Revelation at the end of the story. It's the same call all through the Bible. So my final question to you before we head into communion as part of our response is simple. What advice would you give to your younger self? Yeah. Uh, I guess, uh, sorry, uh, I guess I think the advice would be um, don't wait. I knew that Christ was pursuing me mm. at a young age. And I kind of felt like, eh, I don't need to be mature yet. I'm going to push it down the road and uh, wait till I'm really ready to be closer to him. That's, that's a lie of the enemy, <laughs> pure and simple. So, Paul, younger self, hear these words right now. <laughs> Jesus loves you. He's pursuing you relentlessly. Just say yes. Amen to that. How about you? Uh, all I can do is echo what you just said. <laughs> just take that in, young Mike. Take that in. Amen.